We're here today to unravel one of the great mysteries of all times. <laughs> what what mastering engineers, what recording engineers do. And our our question comes today thanks to Rob in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. Again, King of Prussia? There's got to be some great history behind that. Maybe someone can can chime in and let us know. Oh, what a great name, King of Prussia. Wow. And, and Rob writes, uh, Paul, could you explain the art of a recording engineer and the art of mixing? In, in my simple mind, seriously, if, you, if, if your mind's complex enough to ask this question, it's anything but simple, but, but I, I appreciate the, the humbleness. Once the microphones are well-placed in a good setting, there shouldn't be much more to do other than balancing volumes or adding tracks or effects. Yet, I've watched Professor Johnson spinning dials all over the place during a recording session, and I know that it may take eight hours to mix a five-minute song. What are they doing? Well, I am, I've certainly been involved in recording studios. I am no expert. I wish Gus Skinnis, uh, our good friend who runs the SACD Mastering Center and one of the best recordings and mastering engineers on the planet was here, but I can give you what limited experience I have. So there are uh, several types of recordings made and several types of engineers that, that make them. In its simplest form, uh, say in a live recording, and I know this is with some of Professor Johnson's earlier recordings, like the, the, um, oh, the Red Norvo series, one of my all-time favorites, and that was a long time ago. Those were essentially live recordings that were set up, levels were set, and let the tape recorder roll. He didn't have a lot to do on that. He wasn't writing the gain and trying to make it because, you know, what you'd like to do is have the recording be neutral and transparent, and you don't want to hear the levels going up and down. That said, in the recording studios that I've been in, and I've been in some pretty fancy ones, as, as any of you know that have read any of my, my writings, I uh, the first recording studio I ever really got hooked up to was, was owned by Giorgio Moroder. And Giorgio owned a studio in Munich, Germany, and it was called Musicland. And a number, look it up in Wikipedia, Musicland recorded oh, Led Zeppelin, Elton John, uh, you, you name it, people were there. And that was the very recording studio that I kind of, you know, got my chops on that. And, and uh, there's some <laughs> there's some crazy stories of, of being in that recording studio. And, and one day, my, my uh, upcoming memoir, Confessions of an Audiophile, are coming out, and I will, I'll tell all. Um, no, I'll tell some very interesting experiences in, in, in Musicland and Giorgio and how we were going to open up another studio. Giorgio was going to fund it, and I got, I got uh, in trouble with the Army for threatening to burn down the network. Anyway, and, and all over my hair length. You know, here, look. See, I got, got myself a haircut. But back then I was in the Army, and, and I'm not going to get into the story right now, but I had, I'll just tell you real briefly, I had... I had uh, done the opposite of what most GIs uh, wanted to do. Uh, we were overseas in Munich. Uh, they would go out on what we call the economy, and they'd go out and, oh, you know, drink or smoke or whatever, you know, we were doing. I mean, I, I wasn't into drinking at the time. I was just out trying to find little balls of hash and go out and smoke. That was, uh, you know, that was the... the late 60s and early 70s. That's what I was into. And so what they would do to look cool, because they didn't want to look like a GI, they would put on these long hair wigs. Well, that's kind of that's kind of phony. So I thought, you know, if I'm going to be a phony, I might as well be a phony to the army as opposed to my friends who were musicians and and people on in the music scene in, in Germany. So I grew my hair actually long and long. It was pr probably over my ears and then during the day I would put it up in bobby pins and wear a short hair wig so the army was 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 tricked uh and I was happy after you know five o'clock came the army went home took 
literally let my hair down, took the wig off, let my hair down. And I got in trouble for that and got kind of thrown out of Europe. And when the book comes out, you can read all about it. Anyway, um, what the hell was the question here? Um, oh, well, <laughs> recording engineers. Yeah, so that was my background in, in, uh, in, in Germany with, with Giorgio. So in a number of recordings, especially on a multi-track tape recorder, there are a whole bunch of takes. There are um, uh, times when you want to uh, lower down the volume when an instrument isn't playing so it's not picking up. Uh, even back then, um, they weren't exactly automated boards, but I would watch some of the sessions in Musicland and the, um, was it Reiner? I think his name was? Anyway, um, the recording engineer uh, would be watching very carefully and when one of the like a guitar player or whatever would stop playing he would lower down the volume and, and kind of knew the score and when it was time he would put it back up just to keep the noise levels down in some cases he had to turn it up a little bit and turn it down a little bit but he did so very carefully so you never heard those effects many times they were redoing little parts of it so they would punch in and punch out they um, they didn't ride the gain all that much, but I remember in Dallas with a friend of mine, Bruce Leak. Bruce Leak is a, is one of the better recording engineers out there, and Bruce has done many recordings for our good friend Commander Lowell Graham from the Air Force Band and the Telark, the label Telark. Uh, Lowell's made a number of them. I don't know if that label is still around, but he's a really good recording engineer. And I watched a live symphonic concert that he recorded, and it took him for one one of the pieces in there that was maybe a seven-minute piece, took him hours. And the reason is because they had to, they recorded multiple different versions of it. He He had to increase the gain of some of the rear ambient microphones when the passages got real low they would turn that up so that you could hear more of what was going on and then it came back down and doing it in such a way that you didn't really notice that change but it sounded very natural and the hours it took was because the musicians liked this part and then they had to carefully splice they're following the the score they had to carefully splice it here and put in a better version of that and then change the levels and it's a very complicated process and it, it I, you know, have watched also very simple ones where you set the gain, you let it go. We did one on a piano and did exactly that, and it turned out great. So that's kind of what they're doing. I, I probably should have some guest people come on to ask Paul and uh, get some better answers for you. But that's, in, a, in essence, what they're trying to do. And it's all in an effort to make it sound like they didn't do anything. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Thank you for asking. Bye-bye.